Hello? Testing, 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 testing. No. I think I must uh, give you preemptive apologies. Uh, it's been gremlins all the way uh, today. Um, the, uh, the sound system is giving us problems, so I was wanting to show you a lovely clip of Mariana de Castro performing a, a wonderful Brazilian uh, musical number from the international conference I went to two years ago in Rio, uh, but we couldn't get the sound to work. And, um, and we've got problems now uh, just organising for Terrell to introduce me. <laughs> All right. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the first uh, week of summer school. As you know, it's the 70th anniversary, and um, I think Ken, Dr. Ken Hughes, uh, will be familiar to many of you, that's why you're here. And he has actually lectured for a significant number of those summer schools. He is one of our lecturers who is in demand every year. Um, he's an exceptional man in many ways, and you will know this from your attendance before. But the nearest thing I think we can get at the university to a Renaissance man. Uh, because he has not only distinguished himself in mathematics, as you know probably, he is an expert on numbers theory, been a visiting scholar at MIT uh, after his um, first degrees at, U at UCT and at Warwick. And over the years, he has uh, lectured on a huge variety of subjects in the history of ideas. And I particularly remember one incident when I first was at the university in 1990. And I was in the education faculty, working in the education faculty. And um, the dean was approached by someone who wanted to do a PhD thesis on Leonardo da Vinci, on the notebooks. And there was a bit of consternation because nobody knew who could supervise such a thing. And finally, it was said, well, the only person in the university who could do this was Dr. Ken Hughes. And <laughs> I said, oh, a mathematician. So they said, oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, we'll get him down here. You'll know when he comes into the office because he'll be carrying two large, heavy bags of books, uh, which are, of course, his trademark. <laughs> They're in Madi's office. They are here, of course. We just didn't bring them down here. Um, but I think um, this choice of this year's uh, lecture, we, you possibly don't know also that uh, Ken has always had a, a great, right, uh, great record of civil rights activism. And uh, that has also contributed to his, the breadth of his lectures. And this uh, course on Brazil, I think, will be very interesting, particularly because of the BRICS Association with South Africa, and uh, because he has himself been here and has uh, lots of interesting things to say about it. Not easy, because I do the film program, to find interesting films on Brazil, uh, but uh, there is one tomorrow morning on their hydroelectric, which is uh, works, we, which are probably a little bit interesting, given our, the similarity of our problems at the moment here. But anyway, I'm sure you are awaiting with great enthusiasm Ken's lectures. He's had a few technical problems coming up, but I'm sure he will overcome those and you will have a very, very interesting week. Thank you.
Put this in my pocket. It's off. It's off. It's off now. It's off now. Okay. Well, let's hope that's the last of the gremlins. Um, okay. Uh, now, um, I uh, need to say a little bit introductory to this course uh, about why I'm talking about Brazil. Um, uh, it's a country uh, where um, uh, I, which I know a little and love a lot. Um, I was first in Brazil um, some 40-odd um, years ago. Uh, I was going on a trip to North America and stopped over in Rio and thought I'd add on a trip to the interior province of Minas Gerais, uh, which was a great trip, absolutely fabulous, and I'll show you some pictures from that tomorrow. Um, uh, but uh, the thing which sort of has precipitated uh, giving this talk um, is, of course, the, uh, the world crisis of the last few years, um, which has affected Brazil as it has uh, the United States and the United Kingdom, uh, France and India and all these various other parts of the world uh, where we've seen this great populist wave. So uh, one of the things which has been on my mind is Bolsonaro, who I'm going to get to in the last lecture. Uh, and, uh, and of course, um, I need to say a whole lot about the, the background history of Brazil uh, in order to make sense of what's gone on recently. Uh, and this, is, again, is a subject I, I know and love. Uh, I've uh, never taught it before, I don't think. But you know, my, I, I'm now elderly, and of course, memory uh, is sometimes deceptive. Um, I may have included a lecture on Brazil in one of my composite uh, lecture series. Um, but uh, uh, that's where we're going, and, um, and we're going to start uh, right at the beginning uh, with um, the discussion of the Portuguese seaborne empire, how Brazil came into existence uh, several hundred years ago, um, and uh, the peculiarities of that situation, uh, trying to bring to bear uh, the work of a number of historians. I always like, uh, in the course of these lectures, to draw your attention um, to the work of great scholars, uh, and also to works of art. I was hoping to start with the uh, wonderful uh, opening ceremony, uh, which I witnessed live two years ago, with Mariana de Castro uh, performing uh, wonderful music. I'm going to try and see if we can get that up tomorrow. But we got the picture and no sound. Um, so uh, I want to um, start today by uh, moving on to the um, uh, here's the summary of the lecture. Um, the, and the first lecture is called The Portuguese Seaborne Empire. Uh, and um, and the, the questions I'm wanting to ask are um, why um, we had a Portuguese seaborne empire in the first place? Uh, why did colonialism start in Europe? Um, and, and then, of course, we need to look a little bit at the social structure, so I'm going to say a bit about feudalism, uh, which was alive in Portugal until the 18th century, uh, and in Brazil, arguably, even more recently. Um, and I need to say something about the ideology, which means talking about Christianity. I need to talk about the economy, which means sugar and slaves, at any rate, in the early period. But there's a whole cycle of um, staples uh, after uh, sugar, it was coffee. After coffee, it was rubber. There's a long history of um, development of primary product economies, which is uh, in a very important part of Brazilian history. Um, and then I also need to say something about um, the rivalries with the other great uh, world empires in the, 17th, the 16th and 17th century, the Spanish in the 16th century, and the Dutch uh, 
uh, in the 17th century. I need to say something about the, uh, the um, indigenous inhabitants, the Amerindians, uh, and, I, and I'm going to end with um, uh, the book which um, was my first real introduction to Brazilian society, uh, an absolute masterpiece um, called The Great House and the Slave Quarters. Uh, and you'll see why this is an appropriate book uh, to end the first lecture. Um, so uh, that's the plan. Uh, and um, now we start with um, the, uh, uh, my, uh, my main recommendation for people who uh, read history in English, a wonderful um, book by um, the noted English maritime historian um, C.R. Boxer, The Portuguese Seaborne Empire, uh, 1415 to 1825. Uh, and you'll see that starts um, in the 15th century uh, with the early uh, Portuguese um, navigations um, uh, and uh, continues down to 1825, uh, which is uh, the year uh, when um, Brazil got severed from Portugal. Um, and, um, uh, and I want to say just a little bit about a boxer because uh, he's a fan uh, he's, well, he's dead now, but he was a fantastic historian. Um, I never met him. I was sort of hoping that the, this audience might be sufficiently large that there would be somebody in the audience who had met him because he came out to South Africa several times, uh, notably in the 1950s, and he gave a wonderful series of lectures in Johannesburg on race relations in the Portuguese Empire, uh, which is the title of one of his books. Uh, and um, he, he did individual studies of some of our local heroes, uh, like the Portuguese mariners who rounded the Cape. Um, uh, but he wrote a, a number of major uh, works uh, on Brazil uh, and on other parts of the Portuguese empire. Uh, he had an extraordinary career as a historian um, because uh, he started out right outside the academy. He was, in fact, himself um, a seaman, and um, his experience in the 1930s was largely in the South China Seas. But he was a very gifted linguist, and, and so he got interested in the history of uh, maritime exploration, um, and his first few books are all uh, kind of works on um, the tragic history of the sea, I think is the title of one of them, and that describes the, uh, the, uh, the works themselves. Uh, he was very interested initially in the social history of um, the, uh, the great explorers. Um, and of course, uh, that early history is sensational uh, in all sorts of ways, uh, one of which was that um, it was incredibly dangerous. And the danger came not merely from bad weather and um, uh, kind of um, bad navigation, uh, but also from mutinies and rebellions. In fact, uh, people were more likely to be killed as a result of a, a shipboard mutiny uh, than as a result of um, a, a, a naval accident. Uh, and this was true for the first 200 years of navigation. Um, and, 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 and this is one of Box's great themes. And then later on, he broadened out uh, and wrote this a series of books, gave a, uh, uh, which, many of which were based on uh, invited courses of lectures, because he lectured not merely in Johannesburg, but also in various places in North America and on the European continent. And he was an extremely gifted linguist, uh, not merely in um, Portuguese, but also in Chinese. Um, so there's this amazing uh, kind of um, all-round picture of the development of um, uh, European colonialism laying stress on um, the spread across the oceans. Uh, and um, so that's my first recommendation. Um, I'm, I'm afraid uh, I'm, one, uh, I'm a person who uh, has... Um, uh, sort of got it into his head that sometimes people attending my courses read the books I recommend. Uh, and uh, so 
this is my first recommendation, uh, a great book which uh, more than covers what I'm going to say today, uh, but does so in a particular way. Um, I'm going to need to supplement it by looking at um, some accounts in other languages. Um, I'm afraid my Portuguese is kind of rotten. Um, uh, when I went to Brazil two years ago, um, I uh, thought I didn't have time to go to proper Portuguese lessons, so I'd take a few lessons off the internet. And boy, I can assure you uh, that learning a language off the internet is the worst way of learning a language. So my pronunciation of Portuguese is lousy, and I must apologize to anybody here um, who can speak it properly. Uh, and, um, uh, but anyway, uh, here is my first recommendation. And, um, and of course, um, the book is also available in Portuguese. So there's the, um, there's the Portuguese version. And you can see that it's got a different cover picture. Also a very nice picture showing um, these old ships. And I think I've got some slides of the old ships. Oh no, here's the map. Um, uh, this is a nice map I got off the internet um, showing the growth of the Portuguese worldwide empire. Um, the, uh, the different um, colors indicate um, the uh, kind of um, historic process of uh, penetration uh, of uh, Latin America, uh, Africa, and bits and pieces of Asia. Uh, the, the crucial thing to say, I guess, is that the early days, um, uh, the Portuguese did not attempt to go beyond the coast. In fact, of course, um, the, uh, the, uh, this is true also of uh, the mariners. Um, most of the navigation um, in uh, Europe in the Middle Ages was by uh, vessels which were hugging the coast. Uh, it really d it required the development of considerable degree of confidence and kind of social conventions um, and of course uh, the, the mariner's compass uh, and, uh, and map, map making and map reading uh, before it became normal um, for uh, voyagers to sail straight out into the ocean rather than hug the coast. Um, and, 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 this, and so this is, again, uh, an extraordinary uh, example of uh, kind of uh, the trepidity or the intrepidity of um, the, uh, the, the, the sailors who made uh, the European um, voyages of discovery and voyages of conquest. And, um, and here is uh, a, a, a picture of, um, uh, of a, a drawings of the actual ships uh, on sale at eBay, I'm afraid. And, and here is a reconstruction showing you how tiny they were. Uh, very often, uh, very little um, kind of space below deck. Um, so you can understand that these voyages were kind of claustrophobic. Uh, and maybe that goes to explain um, uh, uh, some of the uh, kind of social problems, problems of discipline, the problems of mutinies, uh, which um, were experienced by the early voyagers. Now, I want to supplement, and uh, now um, uh, Boxer gives a wonderful uh, kind of historic outline of this, much fuller and uh, much more detailed than anything I can uh, attempt here. But, uh, of course, um, I'm uh, really interested in the social and economic history uh, rather than the history of events. Uh, and I, I'm going to draw on the work of two great historians who are not available in English, uh, and, um, and, and, and therefore I must say something about them because I'm going to make heavy use of their work in a moment. Uh, the one is Charles Verlinden, a Belgian historian um, who was a medievalist uh, and who wrote in French. So there's a great two-volume work in French pro, uh, on the history of slavery in the Middle Ages. That was his great subject. Uh, and one of the things we have to uh, ask ourselves when understanding uh, the history of Brazil um, is um, where did slavery come from and how did it work? Uh, and for Linden's work is absolutely the best work there is anywhere on um, 
uh, the growth of slavery in the Middle Ages. Uh, as I said, two massive volumes in French. Um, I attempted to read volume one way back when I was a student. I was a real um, glutton for punishment in those days. Uh, so even these extraordinary big books in French, um, the, the French uh, students used to refer to them as a pave, a, a paving stone, because uh, they were so big and heavy. Um, and, and, and a big part of that work, of course, was uh, numerical, trying to count the number of slaves, uh, trying to uh, uh, develop some sort of model of how they moved um, across the world, where they came from and where they went. Uh, and I will say more about this in a moment. Uh, want, uh, but I want to just uh, segue into the work of uh, the other historian, the great Portuguese historian, uh, Victorino uh, Magalhas Godinho, um, who died in 2011. So he's uh, kind of almost our contemporary. Um, uh, and uh, he was the great historian, uh, economic historian of Portugal. Uh, he um, was driven out of Lisbon University in the 1930s, and for some years he lectured at the Ateneo Club in Lisbon. Uh, and then he managed to um, find his way to France uh, and spent most of the rest of his career there because he was persona non grata with the, um, the regime in Portugal until it fell in 1974 when he went back uh, to Lisbon and became briefly Minister of Education. Uh, uh, but um, his work is almost all written in French and uh, although I think there's some written in Portuguese as well, but a lot of his work has actually been translated from the French into the Portuguese. Um, and uh, his great work is really about feudalism. Uh, and, and, and that's really the link with Verlinden, who got interested in the question about the difference between um, serfdom and slavery. And the crucial point is that serfs were tied to the land. So when um, you sold a major uh, feudal property, the serfs went with it. Uh, and, and the word serf, of course, comes from the Latin servus, which is a word for slave. Um, so, uh, so serfdom, in some sense, was a medieval uh, version of slavery light. Uh, and... Um, uh, and it, it, it continues all the way through. In fact, as I said, um, uh, feudalism continued in Portugal until the 18th century. Uh, and feudalism differed greatly in different European countries, so much so, in fact, that there are controversies about historians whether you should even use the term because it has so many different manifestations up and down Europe. Um, but uh, where you have large-scale um, uh, production with um, serfs tied to the land, where you have feudal privileges. Uh, probably the most extraordinary of the, um, the Portuguese feudal privileges was the right of senior members of the aristocracy to enjoy free hospitality, um, which was only abolished um, in 1708, I think. Um, and it, it wasn't just the king, and of course the king having these um, rights of um, uh, kind of inviting himself to stay with his subjects uh, were perfectly normal throughout many parts of Europe. Um, only in Portugal did it apply also um, to the um, high aristocracy. Um, uh, but uh, uh, Magalhas Godinho is the great historian of uh, Portuguese feudalism, and in particular of making the connection between feudalism and um, the Portuguese seaborne empire. Uh, and um, it's, it's wonderful early work by him where he asked the question, why Portugal? Because Portugal was the first of the great uh, European uh, empires, 
it, it was uh, the Spanish uh, followed in the wake of the Portuguese, um, and then, of course, the Dutch and the English and the French all joined in. But uh, Portugal was the earliest of the seaborne empires, uh, and so the question about why Portugal was really answered by uh, Magalhães uh, Gardinho in his early work, where he looked at um, the rivalry between Portugal um, and the Italian city-states, uh, which were great trading uh, operatives in the Mediterranean, Genoa and Venice. Uh, and uh, the, the big thing there was that Genoa and Venice were essentially trading operations right from the word go. Um, Venice uh, you know, kind of subsequently acquired uh, an agricultural base um, on the terra firma, but um, in the Middle Ages, or, or from its foundation really in the 8th century, uh, Venice was uh, very heavily dependent on trade. Uh, and the big trade uh, was, of course, the spice trade with the Orient, uh, and uh, the, uh, the, the Venetians and the Genoese fought over this trade over a long period of time. Um, the Portuguese were latecomers, and they only, of course, managed to break into the spice trade um, after they had rounded the Cape. Uh, their early efforts to break into the spice trade were not successful. So why did the... Um, the uh, the Portuguese go to sea. Well, the interesting thing that uh, Magalhães Godinho, uh, he has a wonderful uh, uh, early set of papers, and I think there's a book also collecting the papers, um, uh, looking at specific regions, looking at um, the Algarve, looking at um, Porto, looking at um, Braga in Portugal, um, looking at the Basque country in Spain, looking at Catalonia, um, uh, and looking at Italy and saying, what's the difference? Uh, and the big difference is really the nature of uh, the economy, uh, and the point is that the feudal economy was in deep trouble. Uh, by the time we get to um, the 14th and 15th centuries. Uh, and the aristocracy, um, perhaps more than anybody, so uh, they were people um, who were, uh, uh, of course, uh, very proud of their military prowess. So they, uh, they were major um, uh, uh, participants in crusades. Uh, and the... Um, the, sea, the sea connection is, is initially a transport problem, how to get to the Holy Land and how to get to North Africa. But because these guys are coming from an agricultural economy, um, it also becomes a question of labour supply. So, um, so slavery goes together uh, hand in hand with Christianity uh, and, um, uh, and, and then um, furthermore, um, we have this uh, extraordinary rivalry with Genoa, which is uh, importing sugar from the east. Sugar is grown in Cyprus, um, and it's grown with the aid of forced labour, um, basically slavery. Uh, and slavery, of course, is very ancient in the eastern Mediterranean. The very word slave comes from Slav, because they were a major source. Uh, of um, uh, slaves in late antiquity, uh, and uh, this was one of the major exports uh, on the Black Sea trade. Um, so slaves, very possibly from um, Russia or from um, what is now uh, what was in the 20th century Yugoslavia, uh, were employed on the sugar plantations in Cyprus. But the method of sugar production and the employment of slaves. The secret of that was taken by the Portuguese and spread into the Portuguese Atlantic. So we get sugar uh, moving from the eastern Mediterranean um, to uh, the Portuguese Atlantic Isles, the Azores and Lorenzo uh, and um, uh, the other um, tiny islands, uh, first of all on the African coast and then in the West Indies and, and then of course Brazil. Um, so, uh, so this is a, a history where the entrepreneurs are in fact feudal magnates uh, and, and seagoing um, uh, empire is a story about um, the uh, entrepreneur, entrepreneurial side of feudalism. Uh, 
Uh, it's, a, uh, it's an extraordinary uh, kind of story, and it also explains, I think, something about uh, the wildness and the violence associated with uh, early colonialism. Um, so uh, let's um, look at my uh, summary slide. Why colonialism? Why Portugal? Why Europe? Uh, I haven't said too much about why Europe, but it's, it may be worthwhile saying something about that uh, because, of course, um, uh, it's very striking that um, one had uh, ancient imperialism in the form of the conquests of uh, Alexander of Macedon uh, and, uh, and Rome, which was a city-state which became um, a world, uh, but uh, there was, um, in the Dark Ages and in the early Middle Ages, Europe was invaded rather than invading. Uh, it was nomads coming out of the steppe. Um, it was uh, pirates coming from North Africa. Uh, it was um, uh, the uh, Arabs overrunning Sicily. Um, these kind of things. Um, so uh, we have to ask ourselves why there was this fight back in Europe. And a very important part of that um, is, as I said, the Crusades. Uh, so the role of the church militant uh, cannot be discounted. It was a very important part of um, the early motivation of European colonialism. Um, now, traditionally, and you'll find quite a lot of these uh, in Boxer, they are geographical explanations. The, um, the peculiar nature of the European continent in comparison with other continents, the fact that um, there are so many islands and peninsulas and, um, and, and uh, kind of such weird topography, the role of mountains, the limited amount of arable, uh, all these kind of things are explanations for um, why Europe um, uh, was challenged uh, and had to uh, kind of expand or die, particularly as population expanded. Um, but um, the geographical explanations, I think, are always very limited uh, because uh, you can usually look around the world and find other places where you have similar uh, kind of uh, limitations. Um, so I tend to discount the geographical explanations. Uh, there are ideological explanations, there are social explanations, um, and, and I've already given you the main one there, the role of feudalism. Perhaps one should say a little bit more about the violence of frontier societies, because sometimes the violence could be counterproductive. It's very striking that for the first hundred years of English colonialism, um, the English were constantly um, giving themselves an own goal. Um, when it was Sir Walter Raleigh um, founding a uh, colony in Virginia, for the first hundred years, the violence uh, in that society, the dishonesty and the corruption were so great um, that um, the English empire in North America wasted itself away and had to effectively be refounded um, in the 17th century. Um, so, uh, so social explanations are important, and there you've got to bear in mind um, feudalism and violence. Um, and feudalism was uh, very important uh, also in um, the quest for social mobility. Um, Christopher Columbus um, was absolutely determined um, to secure seigneurial privileges in the New World and entered into elaborate negotiations uh, with his Spanish sponsors um, about uh, becoming viceroy of the Ocean Sea uh, and securing his family in perpetual uh, kind of aristocratic uh, domination. Um, and uh, Charles Philinden has written wonderful essays, some of which are in English, uh, about um, the, uh, the legal aspects of feudalism and how it impacted on the new states, uh, the new settlements, perhaps I should say rather, um, in the new world, um, how uh, this um, peculiar feudal local structure uh, whereby a local government was always in the hands of big men from big families was transferred um, to uh, both Spanish and Portuguese uh, America. Um, and uh, in, in Brazil, it's always called coronelismo, because the local military gentlemen are always referred to as coronels, co colonels in English. Uh, and, um, and, and this kind of 
rule, uh, political patronage, um, the sort of weak centralized state, um, the uh, rule of um, strong local men from local families, very often with military titles, is very um, universal. It's ubiquitous in Latin American history and to some extent continues even today. Um, so uh, the, the, the role of feudalism is very important. One should say, of course, that the ideological aspects of Christianity were also incredibly important because the other thing you find in Columbus's notebooks is not just obsessions with um, promoting his family uh, in um, the feudal hierarchy, uh, it's also endless meditations on the book of Revelations, uh, the end of the world. Uh, and uh, we tend in modern times to forget um, how strong uh, the influence of uh, the tail end of the New Testament was on Christian believers of earlier times. Uh, we know, in fact, that in the first and second centuries, um, the early uh, Christians in Palestine were constantly expecting Christ to return uh, because, uh, of course, there's a text which uh, says um, those who are now uh, of those who are now alive, some will see me return in my glory. So the uh, obsession with the end of the world, which is characteristic of Columbus, um, was something which periodically uh, was revived in European social history. Uh, it sometimes took the form of great panic attacks, uh, the deep worry about the year 1000, uh, because um, that was a magic number and might spell the end of the world. Uh, and then, of course, the, the peasant uprisings, which were often seen um, in terms of um, the end of days, uh, and we have this um, general culture of millennialism, uh, which the historian Norman Kahn uh, thought was uh, an important part of European radicalism and explained uh, radical themes in the history of both communism um, and Nazism. Um, so uh, the, the worry about the end of days part of the ideology of Christianity um, on the fringes. Of course, uh, the mainline um, uh, authorities tended to want to keep mil millennial expectations uh, in check, uh, but uh, millennial expectations uh, were uh, diffused uh, by scholars, by monks, by um, itinerant uh, heretics right across Europe uh, and, uh, and play an important part um, in all those late medieval social movements. Um, and, and they also evidently played a part uh, in the ideology of people who undertook oceanic voyages, not just Columbus. Um, then the economic explanations, which I've already mentioned, sugar and slavery, the two went together and not just um, in the West Indies and Brazil, but also uh, fatefully in the American South. Uh, and this thing of the staple cycle uh, with um, various forms of uh, production uh, depending on individual commodities was also a feature of US history and of Canadian history. And the best writing about it is by a Canadian historian, Harold Innes. Um, so, uh, the economic explanations, um, sugar and slavery went together. And then finally, one needs to talk about political explanations, rivalry, uh, which was very often, of course, in those days, rivalry between different royal houses. Um, so the fact that um, the house of Braganza uh, married into the English royal family, um, uh, Henry the Navigator's mother uh, was Philippa of Lancaster, um, was actually terribly important. Uh, and um, so uh, the, uh, the different royal houses in Europe lined up on different sides of these political divides. Um, and later on, there was extensive rivalry uh, between uh, the um, colonists of the Portuguese and Spanish colonies and, and the Dutch. So, uh, conflict with rival empires, the Spanish and the Dutch, 
And as I've already said, the first rivalry was with the uh, Portuguese with the uh, Italian city-states of Genoa and Venice. Later on, there arose a rivalry with Spain, which was mediated by the papacy. Uh, and, and here again, you see the importance of um, Christianity as providing uh, kind of an ideological framework. Um, this is the celebrated uh, Treaty of Tordesillas, which was negotiated in secrecy. Um, and the document which was established between the diplomats representing uh, the Portuguese and the um, uh, uh, Spanish was kept secret. It was kept in a locked apartment in the Vatican. And a few years ago, I was very excited when uh, doing one of my periodic tours around the Vatican, um, I took a, a, a turn through the Vatican Library and found a little alcove where the actual document of the Treaty of Tordesillas was on display. Uh, and, uh, and that is 1494, and it results in a, a, a division of the world into two halves. Um, by that stage, um, they had realized um, the, um, uh, the, the roundness of the globe. It's just two years after Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Um, but... Uh, they have already decided that um, there's going to be a line drawn um, uh, on both sides of the world, uh, which is going to divide the world into two halves, one of which is going to go to Portugal and the other of which is going to go to Spain. Um, and I, I've got a, a, pic, a slide showing the Treaty of Tordesillas, which I'll show you in a moment. Uh, but the uh, absolutely extraordinary thing is the speed of events, because six years later, in 1500, the uh, Portuguese navigator Cabral discovered that Tordesillas did not give the whole of what they then referred to as the Indies to the Spaniards. On the contrary, there was a jutting out part of Latin America which fell on the Portuguese side of the line. Um, uh, and so um, Cabral, by um, going um, to uh, uh, this land he had discovered, um, um, uh, staked out the Portuguese claim to Brazil. And that's already in 1500. Uh, but, uh, and then, of course, we have the whole of the 16th century, which is more uh, kind of rivalry, sort of mitigated by uh, Tordesillas. Um, in the 17th century, the main rivalry is with the Dutch, who, of course, from the Portuguese point of view, are just a jumped-up, revolted part of the Spanish uh, domain. Uh, the Spanish Netherlands was where um, the Dutch um, kind of uh, war of independence um, first broke out. Um, so uh, the Dutch in the 17th century are determined to wrest the slave trade from Africa um, and the spice trade uh, from the East uh, and the sugar production uh, from Brazil um, away from the Portuguese. Um, and so they actually invade um, using their modern military technology because the Dutch royal family were pioneers uh, in the development of modern military techniques. Uh, Prince Maurice of Nassau was one of the great uh, original theorists of um, how to deploy troops with guns. Um, you could achieve a continuous uh, volley of firing by arranging your troops in rows and having um, each row rise all together uh, and fire and then sink back to recharge their rifles. Uh, and this is a, a great innovation. So uh, the Dutch uh, used it in their colonial empire uh, against um, various oriental uh, powers, but also against their rivals, uh, the British and the, um, the Spanish and the Portuguese. And, um, the, uh, and, the, and the Dutch actually ruled um, in northeast Brazil for 30 years, from 1624 to um, 1654. Uh, and when you think about it, that's just two years after Van Rebe came to the Cape. So the Dutch were driven out of Brazil um, only two years after Van Rebe uh, landed uh, in Cape Town. 
Um, and incidentally, that um, history is absolutely fascinating. Boxer has a separate book about it um, called um, The Dutch in Brazil, um, 1624 to 1654. Uh, and it's a social history, because uh, the extraordinary thing is that the, um, the, the profit-oriented Dutch were hard taskmasters um, and uh, drove the slaves even harder uh, than the um, Portuguese masters had done, um, so that uh, when you have the final uprising against the Dutch uh, in the northeast of Brazil, the slaves rise together with their masters against uh, the Dutch invaders. Uh, an absolutely uh, extraordinary uh, kind of story, uh, but also perhaps saying something about um, the Portuguese in the tropics uh, not being um, quite as uh, maniacal as the Dutch. Um, anyway, uh, I want to show you now a great work of art. Um, this is uh, the greatest of the Portuguese Renaissance paintings. Uh, it's by Nuno Gonçalves. It's in the Museum of Ancient Art in Lisbon, um, where I found it on one of my trips to Lisbon. Absolutely overwhelmed by it. It's an incredible painting. Uh, there are six other paintings by this um, painter, Nuno Gonçalves, um, which are also in the Museum of Ancient Art. There are two great art museums in Lisbon. One is this museum and the other is the Gulbenkian Foundation. Uh, but this one, um, it's, it's a fabulous building. It's a wonderful 18th century palace which has been turned into a museum. Um, and this shows you St. Vincent Ferrer, who's a Spanish saint, um, preaching uh, to the Portuguese court uh, and the person um, standing to the right um, of St. Vincent in um, uh, the panel number three is uh, commonly identified as Henry the Navigator, um, so-called, because, of course, the Navigator is his title in English. Uh, in Portuguese, uh, they usually just refer to him as Infanta Dom Henrique. Um, uh, where uh, the title of the navigator was actually conferred by two German historians in the 19th century. Um, so it's a, it's a rather strange story about identifying this man. There's a new biography, or really a relatively new biography of him uh, by um, an English um, historian whose name now escapes me. Um, it'll come back. Uh, and uh, which I read a few years ago, uh, he, he was a shocker um, in not merely an ardent slaver, uh, but also an ardent hypocrite. Uh, when he was taken captive on uh, one of the crusades to North Africa, his brother uh, went as hostage, but that was um, bye-bye to the brother, uh, arrival to the throne, carefully taken care of uh, by... Um, uh, the uh, North Africans who didn't realize what function they were performing in the political economy. So, uh, Henry the Navigator, um, a, uh, a, a, a fanatical administrator and enthusiast um, for crusading uh, and for trading um, and for uh, oceanic navigation, uh, but a person whose uh, reputation has, to, be, to some extent, been inflated. So, there, so as I said, there are these deflationary biographies recently. Um, but there he is in the picture. It's not even certain if this is him, because um, there uh, is a, a minority um, school of art historians who think uh, that this figure is actually um, one of the other princes of the time, uh, and one of the figures in panel four is the, is the real Henry. Um, and uh, there are so few depictions of Henry that this uh, remains a controversial point down to this day. Anyway, here's this great picture, and, 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 and what I want to emphasize is, uh, again, the, um, the, the social uh, fabric you'll see that uh, each one of these panels is um, kind of devoted to a different social stratum in the Portuguese society. Uh, and each of them is being urged by St. Vincent 
uh, to do certain things, um, to uh, read the Bible, to uh, kind of take note of certain precepts. He's o ho holding the Bible open there and pointing with his finger uh, in panel three. Um, and uh, there 